If you see how we have been building the spaces in the last thousands of years, you know, we've been doing the same thing for, uh, since the Roman times. So that was not a problem for 2,000 years, but now we have a big trend, which is urbanization. We have millions and millions of people moving to cities, and we need to start thinking about the infrastructure and how we design spaces. This land is not going to grow. It's what it is. So if we are going to have double people in this place, we better find a, a new way of doing things. All right, you ready? Yeah, at MIT, we are engineers, so we said, can we bring engineering, you know, robotics into the world of architecture? <laughs> Backwards? Backwards? We did a lot of prototypes. Looks like you're flying a magic carpet, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we did like an army of furniture with superpowers. We built a, a 200 square feet apartment. So this idea that you know, people love you know, tiny homes, it's actually not just a cool thing to do, it's what you're gonna have to do if you wanna live in cities in the future, because we are more and more people, and the infrastructure is really, really static and unresponsive. So we at MIT, Media Lab, we've been working there on what we call architectural robotics. And the idea here is you know, architecture and robotics. So how you bring mechanics, electronics, software to make spaces effortlessly transformable. And the word effortless is very important because I've seen thousands of examples of beautiful tiny apartments that are just too much work to transform. So how we can make transformation not be a ritual, how we can make transformation be magical. And that's where the power of robotics comes into play. So if I tell you about 200 square feet, you'll tell me you're crazy. But if you think about a 200 square feet bedroom, it's a nice bedroom. 200 square feet living room is a nice living room. 200 square feet bathroom is like a five-star hotel bathroom. So if you bring technology, if you bring robotics to make that space adapt to you, because all activities are not happening at the same time, then the space can be much more. That's what we kind of try to prove there. So this was this apartment in which you could have the dining room, the living room, the bedroom, all of that with robotics. It could be a gentle touch, it could be gestures, it could be voice. The idea is that your home could be like, a, you know, like an app store in which you could customize functionalities. You could have the voice command application or the gesture application or whatever, a health application, whatever that is. So you could have the same technologies but then your home could be totally different. The same way we customize mobile phones, the same way we, do, we download apps. So we started building that out. That was a prototype, you know, it worked. So, but it was still a one-off. So the focus since then has been, okay, how we can make this scale? You see all these apartment units here? The key of what we are working on is that we are gonna see one unit, but it could be any unit. What if you, know, you could think about technology that could work in one unit, of course could work on the second, on the third, on the floor, and how you could make basically a building be much more than what it is. You see where, where the lights are? So that thing in the middle, that's yeah. one of these moving walls. And the idea is that it's totally disentangled from the apartment. So we just came in almost like an IKEA piece of furniture, just install it, but with the idea that this IKEA piece of furniture has superpowers. So that it moves, it transforms, it connects to the internet, when people hear robotics, they kind of collapse. They think, oh, expensive, crazy expensive. But then people don't realize that when we think about our homes, we are surrounded by robots. The elevator is a robot. The microwave is a robot. The vacuum cleaner that goes around, that's a robot. Think about garage door openers. So the same kind of mechanics, electronics, and software that a garage door opener uses, we are using those kind of complexities to make transformational robotics into apartments. So this is one of the apartments that we're just wrapping up, which is one of the new generations of the system. Imagine this studio without a system like this one, okay? Wider studio, no way of dividing the space. You wouldn't have a lot of storage. You would have a bed. So we put this system together. So do you see it, where it is? <laughs> so basically, this system, it takes kind of complexity. So it takes mechanics, boom, into a box. Electronics, boom, into another box. And then, of course, the software that we don't see. So now you take those components and you start creating systems that, that make interesting things. So for example, they move. But they move with a finger. They don't move with a big push or you don't need to be Conan to move this thing. It's just move with a finger. So you still have a, a living room. But you know, for example, my wife always goes to bed earlier and I would like watching Game of Thrones. So now she can go to bed and I can still watch TV. 
but yeah, when I'm ready to go to bed, you know, my office, you know, can disappear. This could be an office space. This could be a walk-in closet. Or why not? You know, this could be a, a bedroom. And my favorite part of all, you don't need to make your bed. <laughs> this is effortless to me. The idea that I can be brushing my teeth and the bed is just going out. And all of a sudden I have my, my small living room area. Where are the sensors? So some of the sensors you don't even see. So you have these kind of actuators. So all the complexity, so believe it or not, you know, when we think about sensors and technology, you think this is a very complex thing. All the complexity is into a box that just gets attached to the wall. And the rest of this, this is like a piece of furniture normal piece of furniture. It has rollers, of course, because it needs to move, but it's totally disentangled. So we could take this thing out, we could disassemble it in a day, and we could take it to another apartment. This is one unit, but this could be any unit. This could be any apartment, because this system is not designed for this apartment. We were just given this apartment, and we already had the system. We just came in, we assembled it, and the thing works. And now you can think about another kind of apartment. And of course, the speeds are, are totally customizable. Yeah, for safety reasons, we are going slow because you know you don't want a puppy on the way. Of course, there's also safety sensors. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah. That's another question we get a lot, which is this thing moves, it's dangerous, and we are using things that, for example, garage door openers have been using for a long time. For example, when a garage door opener hits you, it stops because it has current sensing. Or, for example, we are integrating sensors that cars yeah. use when they back up. So a lot of real estate developers, what they're doing, exactly what you see here, but they're putting a partition wall that is static, which is interesting because it solves a problem, meaning it divides the space, but think about the new problem. Half of the time where you are not sleeping, your living room just got squeezed. So that is the idea. Can you bring technology to make that malleable and effortless? And I want to emphasize that idea of effortless because, you know, when people think about transformation in spaces, people always tell us, ah, oh, you know, that's older than our grandpas, <laughs> you know? I've seen Murphy beds and I've seen desks that fall. And, and the idea is those things, in order to work, they cannot add a ritual to your daily life. They cannot add like a cognitive load because that's when people stop doing transformation. What about electronic interface in which you don't see anything and all of a sudden, oh, controls just appear. And I just come with just a finger, I feel like Superman right now because with one finger I'm just pushing a whole system and as I'm not sleeping or I'm not using this room anymore, what if I could make the bigger space on the other side? We like to think about urban spaces in general and our point here is that urban spaces are really too valuable to be static and unresponsive. Now we are keeping here a kind of a small like walk-in closet area or office space you could still have here. You could still collapse it, but now your living room just became bigger. So you could be cooking now, or you could be watching TV, you could be having a dinner party. If I'm working, this should be a whole office space. If I'm sleeping, this should be the whole bedroom space. And yes, you can do that maybe with me spending 10 times, you know, moving things around and transforming, or you can do it at a flip of a switch or at a voice command. And that's where technology comes into play. So think about Legos. Think about components. And think about this, which may look like a very complex thing, or with a bed that is automatic and the whole wall moves. Think about compartmentalizing complexity. Think about, for example, a component that has all the mechanical guts. Think about another component here that has the electronics and the brain. And now, the way you combine these things, this is just an example, because what we decided here is to combine these components to create a moving wall that creates a bedroom. But think about, for example, if I tell you, why don't we take this component and we put it on a wall? Instead of being here on the floor, we take the same component, we put it on a wall, and now we can have a drop-down bed. Same exact technology, and now you can have a bed dropping from the ceiling. And now, again, with just one finger. And the guy there, by the way, is, is Carlos, our software guru here, who has been programming all these things. Because remember, this is a computer in some sense. So think about how you could customize it. What do you program right now? So right now I was tuning how fast the bed moves in and how fast the system moves and accelerates. So I don't know you press the button. So this stuff is all would be all done by somebody else before you buy the system. Or... What would happen is that it would come with some pre-programmed functionalities because some people will want just the basic stuff. They just want the thing to move and open the bedroom. That's it. 
but now you can start thinking about more apps could be created and more apps could be downloaded. So that is how people could basically start you know, customizing their, their experience. So this piece here is the thing that connects to the internet. So this is the okay. piece that, for example, can talk to your lights, can talk to the thermostat. This thing can tell your thermostat that you are going to bed because you are opening the bedroom and it's 9 p.m. This thing can talk to this voice command that you can talk to your home. But now you could say, Alexa or Google, you know, open my bedroom or I'm tired and things could happen. Alexa, tell Ori, hide my bed. Look in your bed. Have a great day. In the moment you bring electronics and software, everything is customizable. And so think about the home of the future, the office of the future, the same way you think about these things. It's a platform. It's a platform for customization. Because the apps that you download, that you customize, make you have a totally different experience. So all of a sudden you can have the same core technologies, you can have the same actuator, the same electronics, but this could look whatever. You could have, you know, here for example, you know, we could, you have like a small office space because you wanted to have some separated space. Or you want to have, you know, closet space, whatever that is, you know, ton of closet space. Now, actually, Carlos, who is sitting there, he got one of the first systems. Uh, he can probably tell us more about it, but, but he told us, I want an office. And we put an office in the system. And then after three months, we learned that he never used the office. And then we asked him, Carlos, <laughs> you know, what is, what, why? I yeah, well, when they were <laughs> designing the system, they asked me, like, you know, what different things would you want on it? And I had never had a standing office, but I've seen them before, and I've seen people using them. And I thought it would be cool to try one out. But then I realized that, you know, when I got home, I was kind of too tired to work anyway, so I would never end up using it. So I think I would have appreciated more closet space for, for all my clothes and shoes. <laughs> but that's where the intelligence of the system comes into play. So some people may say, why do you need a system to be intelligent? But what if the system with sensors could know, for example, how Carlos is using the office? And what if the system could tell Carlos, Carlos, you are not using your office, but your closet area is just full. So what did you get your more closet space? So that idea of data and that idea of using the intelligence of the systems, because we are used to devices like that one over here that are kind of super trendy, you know, like the, the smart thermostat. But these things are all in the periphery. What if we bring intelligence to the things that, you know, bring personality to the space? to the things that are center stage of our life, to the place where you work, the place where you store your things, the place where your TV is. But the smartness is here. Now, the way you, you control this could be touch, but a designer could think that voice is the way to go or gestures are the way to go. So this is totally customizable, but we are kind of compartmentalizing the complexity. This is the brain power of the furniture and the architecture of the future, and that is the horsepower. So that is our focus as, as Ori, as a company. We want to create the brain power and the horsepower for the architecture and the furniture of the future. So the cheapest part of this system by far, by an order of magnitude, let's say 10, 15% of the cost is the technology and the robotics. The rest is furniture. The technology, the cost of the technology at economies of scale, we are thinking about garage door openers. You know, we are talking about, no, we're not, we're not talking about thousands of dollars. We are talking about hundreds of dollars for the whole muscle and brain of these systems. To buy an actuator and to buy the... Exactly. And oh. then you just put dresses. But as we know, furniture can be made as cheap or as expensive as you want. You could have the IKEA version. And it could even be DIY. I mean, you could buy... It could be DIY in the future. Right? Why not? Why not? And, that, and that's what gets us really pumped up, which is, in a few years, seeing applications that we couldn't even think of. And that is the idea, create tools for others to create. You know, that, that is one of the powers of technology. You know, it's not just about creating inventions, but it's also about creating tools. And what gets us excited is that we see all this creativity with designers, architects that really understand spaces. Guests come, you pull the moving wall out you know, all these beautiful tiny homes and small apartments, these people really understand space. The challenge or the, the problem is that they necessarily don't understand robotics. So those people, when they try to do a robotic space, they spend most of their time doing things that they were not trained for. If I'm tired, I'm very tired. 
y hoy tengo que andar montando la cama. Voy a sentir que estoy como de paso en la casa. So we thought, what if we could create a toolkit for designers, for architects? What if those people could have, you know, a toolkit, could have mechanics and software and electronics so they could create all these amazing spaces? Something I would love to see. I would love to see all those people that have done those apartments. What if we could give them some of these components? Because it's all in here. Like yeah, this is all in here. So think about a component, just very simple component that grabs the wall and moves it. Of course, the wall just has like a very simple base with rollers. And then this thing over here, this could be whatever. So we've been working, for example, with Yves Behar and his team, a uh, Fuse Project in San Francisco that designed a few variations of this system. But you could think about architects, designers, you know, creating different kinds of walls. But the same way it could be walls, it could also be drop-down beds and drop-down tables. Think about a, an army of furniture with superpowers. You know, think about all these technologies that could create this new generation of spaces. But we don't want to create a closed system. A bunch of guys here in Boston from MIT are not going to design all the spaces of the world. But what if we can provide the tools so that the people that really understand spaces, spaces that are different in Shanghai, in Seoul, in New York, what if those people could have access to tools? And that's what we've been seeing in the software, the maker movement. What if we could bring that to architecture and design? There's two kinds of things you can do. One is program behaviors through connectivity, because we are in an era in which everything is connected. Your watch is connected, your lights are connected, your thermostat is connected. So think about all the rules you could create, all the automatisms you could create in which I just woke up, the apartment knows that I woke up, I'm going to have a shower. As soon as I come back, my bedroom doesn't need to be there. So how everything could transform on the van. If we think Pushing something like this, it's effortless. Imagine if things actually could happen without even almost thinking about them. And then the other piece of things is the idea of understanding a space. You know, something like this could imagine health applications. Your mattress could know how you're sleeping. Your office could know that your posture is right or not. Imagine all the developers that could start programming things and things we couldn't even imagine. Imagine a person like that could say, oh, I'm going to program an application in which I read the status of the space, the status of how this person is sleeping, and I'm going to adjust the lighting conditions to, I don't know, to create a more healthy environment. But possibilities are endless. You know, these technologies keep evolving. They get smarter. They get more faster, more efficient, all of that. So that, that's our focus. And that's why we created this company. Oh. Look, we got the logo there. <laughs> you see the origami on the logo? Uh, the name of the company coming from origami, from the Japanese. So we like from the origami, we like the idea of, you know, ori means fall in Japanese. And that tells you the idea of how, you know, a space, you know, could fall and transform. How large is the apartment? It's around 420 square feet. You could make it much smaller. It's interesting because the moment you make it as tiny as 200 square feet, which you don't see a lot of those in this country, but that's when moving sideways doesn't make so much sense. Now you need to go up. So you could have an actuator that's much longer. You, you could, could have it go all the way down there. Exactly, or even better, you could have an actuator that instead of just moving one system, moves two systems. So the same actuator, you could have a wall like this one, and then let's say another thinner wall. And now all of a sudden you're creating a bedroom, and oops, you're creating another bedroom now. But the same actuator, put it now vertically, and now it can lift something into the ceiling. It can be a bed, it can be a table, but it's the same technologies. We don't claim that we are the first ones doing a moving wall or a moving bed. I mean, there's plenty of examples. What we are trying to do is try to find a strategy that makes it scalable. Now we are looking at solutions that you can take and put in Boston, and put in New York, and put in Seoul, in Singapore. And that's a big challenge we need to fix. And that is coming. The idea of small spaces is coming. People like it or not, if you want to live in the city centers where the action happens and you're an average person, you're not a millionaire, you are going to have to start thinking about how you live smaller. Now, we don't think living smaller needs to mean downsizing. If you bring technology, living smaller could actually mean living bigger or living bigger experiences. And that is the paradigm shift. It is not about us or our activities adapting to spaces, traditional way. That's how Romans were doing things 2,000 years ago. The place where I work, the office. 
the place where I sleep, the bedroom. I'm not sleeping, still a bedroom. The place where, you know, I eat, the dining room. And all those activities don't happen at the same time. So why do we need to have all those discrete, assigned, specific functionalities? And, if, and that's where technology comes into play. That's where robotics and technology make that possible. That is the paradigm shift. It's spaces adapting to us and our activities. Us creating furniture doesn't really scale to the big challenges that we are facing. So we really want to create the technologies that power all this new ecosystem. We really want to create those mechanics, electronics, software that are going to keep evolving because this doesn't end.